The Battle of Marignano took place during the Italian Wars at the time of the League of Cambrai. This was a coalition headed by the Pope that included Spain, the Swiss Confederation and Milan that had been recently liberated by the Swiss from French occupation. The League of Cambrai was at war with Venice and so the Venetians allied themselves with the French, effectively dragging France into that war. In France, the 21-year-old Francis I had been crowned king and he resolved to regain Milan. He conceived a daring plan to imitate Hannibal and cross the Alps at the head of a large French army. Instead of elephants, he had with him between 40 to 70 heavy pieces of artillery. And rather than do this in the winter, he chose the height of the summer to ward off snow and ice that could close down the mountain passes. The Swiss placed strong forces on the main passes through the Alps, but the French king succeeded in crossing the Alps through a minor undefended pass known as the Col d'Argentière. It took only five days for the entire French army, some 30,000 men strong, to cross the Alps. The sudden appearance of the French in Piedmont, not far from Milan, baffled the Allies. Even worse, a strong force of the Papal States under Prospero Colonna was destroyed in a surprise attack. The Swiss sent for reinforcements and the Spanish and the Pope sent armies to block off the Venetians, preventing them from uniting with the French. As the French army was exhausted from the effort, the French king hesitated to march on Milan. He opted instead to rest his men obtain supplies and build a large fortified camp north of Milan. At the same time, he began to treat with the Swiss in the hope he might buy them off. His offers were indeed generous, but in the end, through a series of incidents, disputes and conflicting decisions, the talks were broken. The Swiss army, reinforced by new units from Switzerland, marched out of Milan on the 14th of September, possibly hoping to take the French by surprise. That plan almost worked. The French had left their heavy artillery with their vanguard under Charles the Duke of Bourbon near the burnt-out village of Marignano, some way off the fortified camp near Santa Brigetta that was then still under construction. Billowing dust on the horizon, signaling the approach of a large army, alerted the French vanguard. The artillery crews mount the cannon and the units close at hand marched to their aid. Among them were some Landsknecht pikemen and the elite Black Legion or Black Band. Messengers were sent to alert Francis I and found him in his tent in the camp trying out a new suit of armor. The main body of the French army was then assembled and marched to battle. In the meantime, the Swiss were approaching the cannon emplacements. The Swiss had practically no artillery and no cavalry. A forlorn hope of infantry was sent forth consisting of harbadiers, pikemen and some lightly armed men to take the French cannon. This tactic had proved effective in past actions. The French responded by sending what cavalry was at hand to delay the advance of the forlorn hope as the gunners scrambled to their cannon and the pikemen pulled themselves together. But the French cavalry was unable to stop the Swiss advance. Those cannons that fired had no success in slowing down the Swiss advance. Soon the Swiss were amid the French cannon, taking 50 pieces. Finding their guns of little use against so rapid an advance, the French started falling back. A timely charge by the Duke of Bourbon with what little cavalry he had with him checked the Swiss advance until the Black Band and the Landsknecht pikemen in French pay could join the fray. The main body of the Swiss army following behind the forlorn hope then marched in in three columns, pushing back Bourbon's heavy cavalry. 
at this time, only the German cantons were members of the Swiss Confederation. The old cantons of Uri, Unterwalden and Schweiz made up the Swiss center, while the Swiss left consisted of troops from Basel, Schaffhausen and Lützer. The Swiss right was formed by men from Glarus, Appenzell, St. Gaul and Zurich. A young chaplain named Zwingli marched with his fellow Zurichers. In a few years, he would be a major figure in the Protestant Reformation. A fierce push of pike ensued amid the cannons in a brutal and bloody tug of war contest. Gains were measured by yards, and where some men made gains, others lost ground, and so the melee continued until Francis I arrived at the head of a large body of French cavalry. The French king was mounted on a great war horse that was covered with a blue velvet caparison decorated with golden fleur de lis. He attacked the left flank of the Swiss fallen hope and had some success in checking the Swiss advance on that side. The bloody bludgeoning match continued for hours. It is said that the Swiss had vowed to take no prisoners save the French king himself, and so the battle continued with ever greater fury. Francis I personally led charge after charge. He wrote in a letter to his mother after the battle that he had mounted 30 cavalry charges against the Swiss. The fighting went on even as the sun was going down. The entirety of the French army had now reached the battlefield. Two and a half thousand heavy cavalry, one and a half thousand light cavalry, about 10,000 infantry in addition to the 9,000 Landsknecht pikemen and the 6,000 strong Black Legion that was guarding the pan. He was named a Black Legion because of the color of their clothing, their armor and their flags. Where the French had managed to hold onto their cannon and the cannons could find a clear view to the enemy, they opened fire. But the Swiss could only reform and march forward forcing the French infantry to countermarch so that artillery became of little use in the struggle between opposing pikemen. Lengthening shadows, the smoke of arquebuses, and the billowing clouds of dust created a fog of war, now and then broken by appearances of French cavalry. De Bayard, the French cavalry commander, was unhorsed in this confused fighting and was left behind as his companions retreated. In the half-darkness he threw away part of his unwieldy armor and walked back towards the French side. The battle continued into the darkness in such confusion that it is said that the French king at one point could only rally about him 25 knights with whom to launch a charge of the Swiss. But the battle raged on even under the moonlit night. The French men at arms dismounted in the end to fight on foot with sword in hand. At long last, in the growing darkness, and as the weariness of the two opponents was taking its toll at around 10 or 11 o'clock, or perhaps near midnight, a lull began to fall upon the battlefield. Some reports said that men no longer knew where they were, or where their enemy was, as they groped and stumbled through the darkness. They were dead and wounded, men and animals lying about, as weary soldiers were trying to find their way in the dark towards their comrades. 
Sometimes men encamped and slept for the night where they had stood, numbed by the fatigue, sometimes not far from their enemy. Many of the French commanders had been slain. The Prince of Tormont had died with 62 wounds on his body. The Guise brothers, Claude, Antony and Ferry, who were cousins of the French king, had become separated during the action. Antony searched for his two brothers, joined by the king's retinue. At long last, they found Ferry dead, but they found Claude still alive. He had suffered no fewer than 21 wounds. His right arm had been shattered and his thigh had been pierced by an arquebus. His horse had fallen dead on top of him, pinning him on the ground. His squire had sought to protect him, but had been killed and lay dead on top of him. Yet, remarkably, the French nobleman survived. He was the father of Marie of Guise, later to become Mary, Queen of Scots. When dawn broke, the sound of trumpets marshaled men back to the regiments. The French king drew up his men in three divisions. He took personally command of the French center and the cannons. The left division was commanded by the Duke of Bourbon, while the right division was commanded by the Duke of Alençon. The Swiss reorganized their regiments and with 8,000 men in the center marched to take once again the French cannon. This time they marched as a solid force with a scant fall on hope at their head and the French had time to train their heavy cannon upon them. The cannon shot ripped through the Swiss formations but once again the Swiss reached the French line and another push of pike ensued. The Swiss fought fiercely but were unable to make any gains against the French center and were suffering horrendous casualties from cannon fire. But the Swiss left wing made some progress against the French right under the Duke of Alençon. Alençon's men were pushed back to Marignano causing some panic. Afraid and confused, French soldiers of the right began shouting, all is lost as they withdrew. Both sides were exhausted from the previous day's fighting. The French right was falling back, yet the French left held firm as the Swiss center was unable to make much gain under fire by the French cannons. Victory hung in the balance. Fortune could smile on another side. Then at around 8 o'clock, Shouts of joy could be heard above the clamor of battle. France's Venetian allies, under the condottiero Bartolomeo Dalviano, had at last arrived. Dalviano had uh, sneaked past the Spanish and Papal States armies that had been sent to prevent the union of the Venetians with the French. At first, Dalviano appeared with his cavalry, but was repulsed by a body of Swiss pikemen. But by 10 o'clock in the morning, the main body of the Venetian army, 12,000 men strong, had reached the field of battle. The infusion of 12,000 fresh Venetians tipped the balance of battle. The Swiss disengaged and marched back to Milan, covered by a small rear guard that repulsed attacks by the Venetian cavalry. Thousands of bodies lay on the battlefield between 16,000 and 17,000 dead or badly wounded. Perhaps 5,000 had fallen on the French side, more on the Swiss side. The French king had won a remarkable victory over the Swiss. The French took Milan and the Milanese ruler Maximilian Sforza was taken prisoner and exiled to France. A peace was signed after the battle styled the Eternal Peace, which was not broken until the Napoleonic times. Indeed, the Swiss considered this battle as the end of the involvement 
of Swiss in war, having since pursued a policy of neutrality whenever wars were raging around them. 